old, I took my very first trip to Italy with my parents, who were returning for the first time since they had left to come to America, something I never, ever forgave them for. But it was, it was then that I discovered typography like this that made me want to become a graphic designer. It, it also prompted me to, um, to start collecting specimens of beautiful, beautiful examples of, of Italian and French typography, which I then used as a constant source of inspiration when I was art director of Pantheon Books. At Pantheon, I was an, at, on a mission to prove that you didn't have to shout to capture someone's attention. And the cover that I did for The Lover, I think, is the best example of that. Marguerite Dura was not very well known in the US. And in spite of that, and in spite of this very understated cover, the book became a runaway bestseller, Pantheon's first since Dr. Zhivago in 1958. So I think I proved my point. But um, one thing that was going on at that time in, pu in publishing is that art directors were so poorly paid that we all had to freelance for one another. And I got a call one day from a publisher who I had never met before uh, or, or worked with, who called and said, we have an Italian Nazi fascist homosexual novel that's just perfect for you. <laughs> so, so one day it would be fascist typography and the next day Wiener Werkstatt. There, there were no books at that time, there were no reference books on design or type history because Steve Heller, who was not yet my husband, hadn't written them yet. But I had to, I had to amass my own archive to, work, to draw from. Thus, I had many excuses to travel to um, Europe and mostly Italy. But I would do whatever I had to do to avoid using standard fonts. I would either scan out of old type books and piece together the missing letters, or I would just hand letter it from scratch, whatever it took. And this is arguably the worst title in the history of book publishing, I think. The thing happens, la cosa succede. 20 years later, I still can't tell you what this means, but um, it was actually a good book of essays by the film critic of the New Yorker magazine. So um, I decided to use these little plaster letters that were designed in the 1940s and 50s to make your own home movie titles. And you'll see this appearing again later. So 2,000 book jackets and 11 years later seemed as good a time as any to start my own design studio, where I decided to, to focus on the, thing, the only things that I'm interested in, which is food, type, and all things Italian. Um, but I quickly learned the two very important lessons of having your own business. One is that you should never depend on any one type of work or any one client. And secondly, you should never sit and wait for the phone to ring with the perfect job because there is no perfect job. The perfect job is the one that you make for yourself. Uh, and as a designer, you have to have your own personal projects to work on because I think it's the only way to really grow and find your own design voice. So I started with what was closest to my heart, Italian Art Deco. And this was the first in what became a series of books on Art Deco graphic design that I did with Steve. We would collect and select the work together and Steve would do the writing and then we would design the book in my studio where I had two rules. There always had to be a woman on the cover, which was never difficult until we got to Germany. Um, but we found somebody. And we would always design a font uh, specifically for that book that was, um, that was based on some, some, type, some letter form that was uh, in one of the images inside the book. So um, the books did well and they, they finally went out of print. So we took a selection of each of the books and put them into this book, Euro Deco, which was until recently still in print in hardcover. And then from there we did typology, type design from the Victorian era to the digital age, and design connoisseur, and many, many others. But after having focused for so long on book covers, I decided to go inside the book for a change and, and start designing book interiors. 
But there was always one aspect of um, book design that really, really bothered me, and that was the copyright page, which is a lot of legal information. It's dreadfully dull. It has to be set line for line, exactly the way they give it to you, or so they say. So I was doing a gardening book, and I set the type all in centered lines. And I looked at it, and I thought, with a few tweaks, this could look like a tree. So. I tried it out on my son, who was two years old at the time, and he got it, so I figured that we were good. I sent it to the copy editor, who um, was apoplectic at the idea of this typographic blasphemy. She, she kept saying, it's against the rules, it can't be done. I, f I showed historical reference, because I certainly wasn't the first person to ever contour type before. I showed Marinetti and Apollinaire, Finally, I got the publisher on my side, and it got approved. So once I had one approval, it was much easier the next time I tried to convince a publisher who tried to say no, like this one. This, this was a book of poems to Edward Lear. Um, a strange book by an Englishman called You Can't Be Too Careful. He had collected newspaper clippings of strange ways that people had died. Aperitif. Uh, this was done with Art Spiegelman, it's called Wild Party. Uh, a guidebook to the best tea shops in, in the UK. Lost Words of Love. And Writing New York, and I was very lucky to have the Empire State Building right outside my window at that time. And I'd always wanted to build the Eiffel Tower out of type, so this was a great opportunity. This was called the Historic Shops and Restaurants of Paris. Photographs of the Twin Towers. And I think the only reason that I agreed to do this book of photographs of volcanoes was so that I could do the copyright page. <laughs> Cuban Deco. And a series of cookbooks, one on chilies and one on beans. And um, another Another series, uh, this was a baking book, and that was followed by a breakfast and brunch book, which we also embossed onto the, the uh, binding. And this is a little guidebook to artisan shops in Florence that I wrote and designed. And um, oh, I don't think you can see the gray stitching on this, but this was uh, essays on baseball. So having grown up in an Italian-American household, it should have come as no surprise to me, well, an Italian-American household where the main topic of conversation every morning was what to make for dinner, it should have come as no surprise to me that I would end up working in the food industry. Um, this is actually a poster that I did many years ago for a talk that I gave in Cincinnati, Ohio. I had been to Cincinnati one time before this, and uh, it was to judge a design competition. I remember that I had to get up very early in the morning, take a flight out there. They met me at the airport, whisked me away to a beautiful Art Deco office building to the basement where the judging was being held. And I kept asking if I could get a cappuccino, and this became the running joke of the day because there, believe it or not, there was no cappuccino to be had at that time in Cincinnati. So uh, about a year later, I got a call f from the president of the Cincinnati Art Directors Club to invite me to come out to give this talk. And the first thing he said when I answered the phone was, Louise, we have a cappuccino in Cincinnati now. So um, I decided to make that the theme of my poster. And when I look back at this poster, I realize what an artifact it is uh, for two reasons. One is that uh, this was done pre-Photoshop. I don't know if you know that there was a time when there was no Photoshop. But, and if you have about an hour, I could explain to you how we did this poster. Um, but it was also done pre-Starbucks, which is also <laughs> hard to believe. It was a better time, I think. So I decided to embrace the very curious world of restaurants, and I quickly learned that in New York City, Restaurants are the number one business most likely to fail. But on the other hand, I always had a table until the restaurant closed, which happened a lot. Um, so in the beginning, I found myself designing uh, logos for restaurants with unpronounceable French names that were owned by people who were neither French nor could they even speak French, like these two. 
And for a spa, um, I wanted it to look like a typical en enamel French uh, bistro sign. And I have a book that I love to refer to on, so it was a French sign painter's manual from the 30s. So um, I, I actually convinced the owner to l let me let me uh, order a, a sign in enamel, which we had made. So when the restaurant closed, which is the punchline you're gonna hear a lot, um, I got to keep the sign in my kitchen. So it was win-win. Um, here's another unpronounceable name. But this was, think, think about this in the pre-Google era where you have a name of a restaurant that, that no one can spell, pronounce, or remember. How is anybody ever gonna find their way there? So the original logo was actually just the type in the shape and color of an olive that was meant to be a little memory aid for people. Um, and actually the script that was used here, this was hand lettered, but it was based on Adonis, which is a metal font that I used to, I used to order in hot metal in many years ago. Um, so this, and then this was then adapted to the menus and the plates and everything else. This is what I call a default name because a lot of times restaurateurs can't be bothered to spend any amount of time thinking about the name of their eatery. They think any old name will do because the logo will make it look good. So this was in the Hotel Metro, so they creatively decided to call it the Metro Grill. Um, and the only thing that this had going for it, it was that it's located in the garment district and a lot of the clientele in the hotel was from the garment industry. So I decided to have this made into a stitched clothing label. Minimum quantity, 5,000. So I had to find other uses for it um, or the client would have gotten really mad. So, and of course all clients like to hear that this isn't gonna cost you a penny, right? So. I said, well, we'll take the remnants of the upholstery fabric and we'll put them into menu sleeves and then we'll just put the labels on and it will, it will hardly cost you anything. So of course they loved that idea until we found out that there were no remnants, but by then they were sold on the idea, so we just bought more fabric. And Metrazur was in Grand Central Terminal uh, on the mezzanine right, right below their beautiful constellation ceiling. And it was named after a train line along the French Riviera. So I decided to make it into a luggage tag for the business card. So this was letterpressed on both sides because I tried to use letterpress whenever possible in, in restaurants because I think the tactile quality is very, a very important way to communicate appetite appeal. So, so the letter pressing this on both sides was the easy part. The hard part was getting somebody to put that hole that grommet on there with the string, but we eventually got it done. And this is the same owner as Pichelin, another unpronounceable name for New Yorkers. Uh, it's a, it was a French bistro spe specializing in cheese, so I decided to make the logo look like a cheese label. And, we, and this is the business card. It was printed on extra, extra thick paper stock. And unfortunately, a lot of people in the restaurant mistook this for a, um, a coaster and, and, and put their drinks on top of it instead of taking it home. So here's another restaurant called 92. Can anybody guess what street it was on in New York? Um, so I was, t I was on my way up to, to the construction site for the first time and I was taking extra special notice of the subway mosaics, which I've always been very fond of. And uh, I went back with my camera and I photographed every nine and every two and we photoshopped them together to make this. And what I love about this logo is that, of course, in Fianza, no one would be expected to know that this is a visual metaphor for the New York City subway system. But there are actually people in New York who don't even know that there's no 92nd Street stop. But I did find that the longer I worked on this logo, the more I became convinced that there was a 92nd Street stop. And once I looked at the Photoshop file and I saw that there was an outline layer, I saw that we had our children's menu. So this was given to every kid in the restaurant with a red, yellow, and green crayon. And the client was very happy because it said, this will keep them busy for a long time. So remember that book with the bad title? 
Wasn't I excited when I got a call about this restaurant? It's, it was actually a restaurant and cinema with a 40s theme. Unfortunately, the people who made the plaster letters had gone out of business, so I had to order the letters in plastic and then spray paint them and sand them down so that they would be less perfect looking. And I worked with the same photographer who did these photo montages. And um, this is my favorite uh, menu. This is the dessert menu fan. And this is, um, this is a very unique restaurant, Italian restaurant in Seattle, Washington, that's owned by a very good friend of mine uh, called The Pink Door. So this was all using um, metal and wood type that I scavenged. Um, and it was based on a pasticceria pattern that I had in my collection, which I'll show you in a moment. And, uh, but it's, it, I wanted to convey the, the lively quality of this restaurant because on any given night there will be a trapeze act. They, they have a trapeze in the main dining room, uh, a, a fortune teller and or, and or a cabaret act. So that was letter pressed also. And this client came to me and said, we want to open up a restaurant that feels like a seafood shack that you would stumble onto while walking along the beach except that you're in the middle of New York City. So this, this logo seemed like it had to break all the rules. I, I normally would never hyphenate a, a word in a logo like that, but I, I wanted to give it a, a, a quirky quality. And when they opened up their sister restaurant, the Mermaid Oyster Bar, we flipped her and put a pearl choker around her neck over here. And then they opened up another restaurant next door called uh, Pizzeria Sirenetta. And since, since this was a little mermaid, we had to cover her breasts this time. And a lot of the logos I do, since I'm so passionate about signage, are based on signs. Um, Chiquito is a Bosque restaurant in New York, and I, I've always loved the wrought iron script signage from Spain, so I did a lot of researching on that to do this logo. And Pearl was the, is the original oyster bar in New York City. They were way before Mermaid Inn. Um, and she never had a logo before. She had been in business for 15 years and just had a hanging black and white sign that the sign painter did, um, which wasn't much of a logo. So I decided that I would make this logo the same, the same size and proportion and color, black and white, as the original hanging sign and just make it look like it had been designed by a better than average sign painter. And for this sign, um, we actually, f for this logo, we actually started with the sign. It, f the client actually requested that we do the sign in wrought iron, and how often does that happen? So, uh, so I had to design the script that, that could be made out of wrought iron, and then we sort of worked backwards from there to do the other components. Uh, Via Carota is my favorite Italian restaurant in New York. It's owned by two very esteemed women chefs. One of them is originally from Tuscany, where she lived on Via della Carota. Uh, but but uh, when we had the first meeting, they made it very clear to me that they did not have any interest in seeing a carrot or a street sign in their logo. Uh, that, which was, a, for me, a, a missed opportunity because I love working with signs, street signs, of course. But I also love the Stile Liberty uh, style of typography that was used in Italian posters in the early 1900s. So that's where these letter forms were referenced. Uh, so that was the business card. Here are the matches, the coasters with a monogram. The oversized menus, which just happened to fit perfectly into the backs of the chairs. These were chapel chairs that they ordered from England with a pocket in the back of the, of the chair to put your Bible or your menu in this case. So when I was doing research for the Italian Art Deco book, I was in Milan one stifling afternoon in a storage room that was filled to the ceiling with with packing boxes, and inside of every box were, were hundreds of little pieces of paper. They were all printer's proofs from the 1930s. 
So needless to say, I was in a happy place. Uh, but this is where I discovered this trove of pasticceria papers. These were all used in the pastry shops to wrap, to wrap up pastries um, in the, the 20s and 30s. And they all looked like they had been designed by the printer because they, all had to, they were all marked up with corrections and um, changes in wording or changes in the name and address of the pasticceria. And they were all done by the same printer. So this is what made me want to go into package design. And one of my first clients, uh, despite the Italian name, is not Italian. They're based in Atlanta, Georgia, Bella Cucina. But it, this gave me a good opportunity to work with a lot of different styles of fonts and, and different kinds of containers. And they're not afraid of a little hand labor, which is always good to have a, a client do. But a lot of what I do in, um, in food packaging are makeovers because very often when somebody starts with a food product, they don't have the budget or the know-how to hire a real designer. And if they're still in business after five or 10 or even 25 years, they'll reach a point where they realize that the quality of their graphics doesn't measure up to the quality of their product. And that's when I get a call from them. So um, it gives me, it, it, I love doing makeovers because it gives me great satisfaction to clean up after someone else's mess, especially when it's a typographic mess. Um, and I've also learned that you can change a lot as long as you keep one or two key elements in, in the logo. So Tate's was, um, is, is the best-selling chocolate chip cookie in the United States. Um, and they didn't have much of a logo to start with, so there wasn't a lot to work with. But I decided to keep the rectangle and keep the color, sort of. And then we just changed everything else. And Sarah Beth's had had this label for... 25 years, and when I looked at it, I knew that the printer had been designing it because it, not in the good sense of the pasticceria papers, by the way. This just looked like it re reeked of Microsoft Word. Why else would it say under here, it says, spread the word, and it's in italics, quotes, and underscored, and it means nothing. So she was very nervous about making a change, and I said, look, we'll keep the same jar, we'll keep the same oval, We'll keep your name in upper and lower case, and then we'll just make everything more refined, which made a huge difference. And then it, it went on to other products that she's done, including uh, this fan for her restaurant in Japan. Uh, another jam client, this one is, is a much smaller company. Bonnie's makes the jam herself in copper pots, and she made the label herself using a free font. Can you tell? Um, but, but her sentiment was right. She said she wanted it to feel like a, a jar of jam that you would buy in, uh, in a market in the south of France but, uh, that some French grandmother made and made her own label in her charming French handwriting. So I said, okay, so we'll, we'll make you a font, but we'll base it on these handwriting samples that I have from the 1940s. Um, so that made a big difference, and that got her into the stores that she needed to get into. Uh, everyone should have a gelato client, don't you think? Um, this was a Sicilian diamond cutter who came to New York and was very, and he really missed his, his delicious gelato from Sicily, so he decided to make his own. And I, when I met him, he had had his business and this logo up here for about a year, and I told him I would never walk into a gelateria with a logo like that. So then I showed him the pasticceria, pasticceria papers and I explained that, you know, every, gelato is what makes everybody so happy. There has to be some kind of nostalgia in this. Um, so he agreed and this became the new logo, which is seen everywhere in New York. They have carts on the High Line and they even imported a vintage Fiat Cinquecento from Sicily. And we were all fitting in that car. Um, so the only thing better than having a gelato client is having two gelato clients. <laughs> and, and, uh, and they both make equally good gelato. This, this place was from Maine, and they had a terrible name. And, and unfortunately, I couldn't talk them out of that. Uh, but, I, but the container was also at the worst, the worst I think I had ever seen. Uh, 
but uh, the one thing I think they were doing right was having it in a clear package so you could see the beautiful colors of the product because they do have some very nice colors. Uh, so so I, I thought it was a good idea to, to make the, the label into a shape so you could still see still more of the color, which was kind of important. But, um, but doing this project made me realize two things, and this has come up in, in both Sarah's talk and Astrid, the, that, well, in my mind anyway, I think a, a good package design can actually make something taste better. I've always said that, and people laugh, but we know otherwise. And I also think that um, a bad name can seem less bad when it's a good logo. So that taught me something. And this is what the freezer looks like in my studio on any given day. Um, I have a rule in the studio, whenever I ha have to schedule a client meeting to present a, a design, I always schedule it for the afternoon, I always serve gelato first, then I show the work. <laughs> and it, it usually always works in my favor. If it doesn't, they shouldn't be my client. Uh, so late July was the first organic cracker on the market, and the client was actually open to the idea of a vintage-looking package. So everything on this package is hand-lettered, even the net weight down here at the bottom. And Ambessa is a line of teas uh, by Marcus Samuelson, who's a very um, high-profile chef in New York. And this kind of represents his personal story because he... He has a great backstory. He was born in Ethiopia. He was adopted by a Swedish family and grew up in Sweden, and then did his uh, apprenticeship in Switzerland, and then went to New York, to Harlem, to cook. So, so by just by using this um, this pattern that I kind of made up, because originally it was supposed to be Ethiopian, and I couldn't find any Ethiopian reference. Uh, so I just sort of made it up, but, but in using different color combinations, I, um, I think we got that across. And there's always something good to drink in the studio, which is always a good thing for everybody. Um, this is a series of wines that were imported from here from Italy, um, that where I decided to make the, all the labels look like miniature posters from the early part of the 20th century. And Trattori is, is the deco-inspired one. Um, this is from the Salento area, so I wanted to reference Itruli, the little cone-shaped huts, as the pattern. And this one, Sfida, was literally una sfida, a challenge, because there was all of this text that had to go on the front of the label, and the label had to be a very specific size and shape, which was extremely challenging. So every now and then we do something that's not food related, which is not nearly as interesting, but it's okay. This was a monogram for Tiffany. It had to be able to be used as small as on the winder of a man's watch or as large as a construction shed, which was a challenge. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with Hanky Panky. It's a lingerie maker. I've seen them in Italy and I'm sure some of you have gotten an invitation from Paperless Post as well. These last two were both makeovers. And I'm always searching for excuses to travel to Italy uh, for a project. So this is um, a guidebook to artisan shops in Florence. I showed you the copyright page that I've done three editions of now because the stores keep closing. But um, and then that was followed by this book. The only way I can describe it to you is that it's all the things that we love and sometimes love to hate about Italy, but mostly love, of course, like hand gestures and fare la coda. Which, and I was very happy that I found the perfect uh, illustration to, to uh, convey that concept. And this was a great project to work on. This was uh, Rizzoli International for the 150th birthday of Italy, they wanted to reissue the 10 great novels that shaped the nation. And I'm sure a lot of you had to read these in school, right? Um, so most of these were done in wood type uh, with, a, with a cloth spine. It was a three-piece case that came out very well. And then these are the, the more recent books that I've done with Steve. We call this the S series, scripts, 
shadow type, and I was very lucky when we were working on this one that I just happened to find, because this was after the, 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 the plaster letter people went out of business, but I found in an antique store a complete set of the, um, of the letters so we could make our own. Stencil type and slab serif. So these all include our um, pieces from our collection. This is for the School of Visual Arts where I teach. Um, every year they, they do the Senior Library which is a showcase of all of the work by the graduating senior graphic design students and there are over 200 of them. And every year they ask a different instructor to design the book and you can do anything you want, which is a scary thing for a designer. So I decided to make it into a beautiful box of chocolates. When you open it, it looks like it is a box of chocolates. So a lot of students were very disappointed when they opened it and found only a book inside. This was, and the school is known for its, um, <clears throat> its subway posters, which only appear in the subway. And when I was invited to design th this first one, um, <clears throat> I immediately thought of doing it in mosaics because you know, I was surprised that, it, that, that no one had ever done that yet. Uh, and since we had done Restaurant 92, I thought, well, we know how to do that. That'll be simple. But you know, a two-digit number is a lot easier than a 13-word poster. And this was done in Photoshop tile by tile. By the, my staff never wants to hear the word mosaic ever again. And by the time we finished it, we all agreed that it probably would have been easier to have done it as a real mosaic and have it photographed, but it wouldn't have been the same. But um, after two, two months in the subway, it came above ground and was blown up to uh, 11 meters tall and it was is on the side of the main building. And just by luck, the yellow arrow happened to point not only to the school, but to my studio, which is right over here. <laughs> so that was the year of the, tall, of the tallest thing I ever designed and the shortest thing in the, in the largest print run. This was the first love stamp that I designed for the United States Postal Service. And it was done in a run, it was a less than an inch tall and it was done in a run of 250 million. So the next subway poster I knew was going to be coming out in April and we had had a terrible win winter in New York that year so I knew that by April New Yorkers would be craving a dose of spring. So I took an old seed package and, uh, and referenced the, the type style from my collection of seed packages. But they were also very insistent that we put the, SVA, the new SVA logo in the poster. And no designer wants to work with anybody else's logo. It, it's, it's very annoying. So I buried it right here. And when it came time to do the next poster, I thought, well, this time I think I better start with the logo because it's, it's such a nuisance to work with. And I thought, well, what would the logo look good stamped into? How about chocolate? So here it is. <laughs> and we made it into a uh, chocolate bar. So everything you've seen here and more is in my monograph. Um, and why did I do this book? So that I could do this copyright page. <laughs> and, my, and after the book came out, my publisher, Princeton Architectural Press, had started a gift line and they wanted to know if I had any ideas. And I said, well, you know, I love to collect Italian pencil boxes from the 1930s, especially the ones that have double-sided um, points. Uh, so they, li they like that idea. So um, rather than doing red and blue on either end of the pencil for teachers to correct homework, I chose red and black because those are my favorite colors. And I named it Perfetto. And they wanted me to put my name on it, I guess because my name is so close to Fila, the, the, pencil, the real pencil company. Um, so these are Italian pencils that were made in China. Um, but the, uh, so they don't work as well as uh, Italian pencils would, but, uh, and that, that was followed by colored pencils called Tutti Frutti. And what I hadn't, I hadn't factored in was that 
This came, these came out at the same time that the adult coloring book revolution was hitting really hard. So these sold very well, which was a good thing. And then those were followed by Brillante, which are metallic colored pencils. So um, for many, many, many years, I've been photograph photographing signage in Italy obsessively. Whenever I come here, I always try to go to a, a city or town that I've never been to before just so I can document the signs. But I, I started doing this with, um, years ago with 35 millimeter slides, then I worked my way up to point and shoot snapshots and then finally digital. And it was never my intention to, do, to reproduce these in a book. It, they were always just for my own reference and enjoyment. But as the digital technology got better and better, I realized that maybe it was time for a book, especially because I was noticing that the signs were starting to disappear at an alarming rate. So I went back and re-photographed as much as I could with my secret weapon, a telescoping pole. It's not a selfie stick. And it gave me what I'd always wanted in life, an extra three feet of height. So, um, so whatever was no longer available to reshoot, we just had Photoshop take care of it. Um, this is a, a truncated version of the uh, telescoping pole. And um, this was in Venice where I had to rephotograph all of the um, mosaics on the pavements. This one, this was right, I had just arrived um, from the airport, and I couldn't wait to photograph the sign, but then when I realized how filthy it was, I had to go buy baby wipes and clean it up before I could shoot it again. And I just met someone at lunch today who is from Venice, and he knows this sign very well, and he's making it into a font. He's doing a really, really good job. I love this sign. This is one of my favorites in Venice. So the interesting thing about this book is that when it came out, to my great surprise, it got a lot of good press here in Italy, which I wasn't expecting at all. And what a lot of people said was kind of the same thing. They all said, gee, we walk by this, this signage every day and we never took note of it, and it took an American to come here to make us appreciate it. So that was nice. So before I even finished this book, I was planning the next one because I really felt a sense of urgency to, f to document this before it was all gone. So the next stop, Paris, of course. And I thought, oh, th this will be much easier. It's only a city instead of a whole country. But it's a big city, and a lot of the classic neon script signage like this was disappearing at a really alarming rate. So I, I ran around trying to uh, shoot as much of this as possible. And then I focused on mosaics because those are harder to remove. And I did a chapter in the book called Sam Mo, without words, because I love these anthropomorphic signs for restaurants. This is Le Chien Qui Fume, the smoking dog, which inspired me to do a logo for a rotisserie chicken restaurant in New York called Poulet Sans Tête. And they actually, <laughs> and they actually made it into a neon sign, which was really great. So this is the most recent uh, sign book. Uh, on Barcelona, which of course has an amazing, amazing signage, as many of you already know. And, uh, and not just the signs, but the materials, the mosaic and, and wrought iron and stained glass is, is, is really beautiful. And these signs too are in peril. So, and what I do for these books is I spend a lot of time on Google Street View, just going up and down in my office in New York, going up and down every street to to try to f locate whatever I've shot p previously. And then while I'm in that neighborhood, I see what else I can find that I didn't know about. So it saves a lot of time once I'm there, but it still is, is a lot of work. But this is a sign that I couldn't wait to see in person. I had only seen it in a book, and I had been checking on it regularly on Google Street View, and it was still there. Uh, it's the last sign for a photo studio in this kind of style, which I've always loved. So um, as soon as I arrived in Barcelona, I literally ran to this spot to photograph it. And this is what I found. That's what I said. So I was devastated. I felt like I had missed the removal of this by a matter of minutes, and I probably did. So the next day I was interviewed, it just happened that I was interviewed by a reporter from El Pais, 
and I was still so upset about the sign, that's all I wanted to talk about. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't even realize that that's what I was doing, but um, the next day when the, the article came out, of course he mentioned my, uh, my complaint about the sign, and a week later when I got back to New York, I got an email from Angel Lopez, who was the grandson of the original founder of, of the studio, and he said, my family and I were very moved by the article. We just wanted you to know that if you ever come back to Barcelona, we will remount the sign so you can photograph it. <laughs> so I went back immediately. <laughs> and the whole family came out for the event. And I dedicated the book to them. <laughs> Thank you. So in the last couple of years, I've started doing something that I n said I would never, ever do. I've started designing fonts. It started with this one, because in the past, you know, whenever I'm doing a logo, I just design the letters that I need. I'm not, I have no interest in doing the whole alphabet or the numerals or the diacritics or punctuation or anything. So, uh, but the Hamilton Woodtype Museum uh, in the US was doing a, pro a legacy project where they invited different designers to design a font that would be cut out of wood and also be made available digitally. So that seemed kind of interesting and I, and I wanted to do something in the Italian futurist style. This was uh, based on a couple of different styles of, um, of fonts that I had seen, one of which I saw at Tipoteca with Sandro. So, so this was made into wood. It was named Mardell because uh, they named all the fonts after their pantograph operators. And Mardell Dubeck came out of retirement to cut the, the type for this, which was pretty great. And then they sent me a set, which I have framed in my studio. I don't think I'm gonna print from it. <clears throat> and then I did the series of posters that were printed in letterpress that they sell at the museum. And, and then it just so happened that I had a, a retrospective exhibition in New York and there was this eyesore of a staircase that ha I had to figure out how to cover because it was so ugly. So I thought, well, all I have to do is find 12 different pasta names that are all of equal length. <laughs> and that worked out really well in Mardell. That was followed by um, Montecatini, which is this letter form that I've come across a lot on Italian posters from the Stile Liberty period again, and they love doing these, these crazy ligatures, which I've always been very fond of. So um, Montecatini is done in 24 different style, different widths and, and weights with 200 ligatures. And thank you, Reiner, for your help. <laughs> and Marion. And then that was followed by Marseille, which is, do you notice they all start with the letter M? I'm really stuck now. <laughs> they, um, Marseille is a French accented typeface, which was based on the letter forms that I used on the, the cover for the lover way back at the beginning of this talk. And so in a sense, I've come full circle. Grazie. <laughs>